Hello everyone, I am Tassa, and today I'm going to be going over the Gems of War event objectives for the Twinkle Twinkle Little Dragon event in which the Twinkle Berry is added to the game. Of course, uh, this week ends up bringing the end to Campaign 8. Uh, we of course had our first ever week-long Vault event that is now to an end. We no longer have the Wish Gems, Campaign 8 is over, and as with uh, the between of every single campaign, uh, we now have a week of uh, Tower of Doom uh, going on, which uh, feels like it almost never happens these days, but uh, that's one of the main things we have going on. Uh, there's also a new uh, glory trip that I'll be going over that's actually really meta that's in the event key drop table that you can only get this week. Uh, then it won't be in the drop table for about a month and then it'll be in the drop table back with everything else as the usual normal weird cycle of those trips. But anyways, let's start off with the standard uh, glory trip. So as far as this trip is concerned, great time to be stocking up on green purple arcanes. Quite a few really good things end up using this. Probably most noteworthy is uh, if you're a newer player, a great week to be a newer player this week because uh, you can actually buy this twice. And this will give you four uh, green purple arcane. And then you can go upgrade a leprechaun. A leprechaun's in the event key drop table. And you can simply just get it there. End up upgrading from this. And boom, you've got yourself the best man accumulator in the entire game. Uh, very easily. So that's going to be pretty nice. As far as this trip itself, it's pretty bad. It's similar to the legend uh, that is green blue that converts all blue to green. This is similar in that it's a green purple that converts all purple to green. Uh, deals some damage to an enemy and it's boosted by green gems converted. It is extremely underwhelming and you're never going to be using it. Even the legendary form of this uh, dragon is basically never used. And this is an even weaker version of that legend. So I have no clue why it was even made. As it is just a completely inferior troop of an already inferior troop. Which makes uh, pretty much zero sense, but you still get it for kingdom upgrading purposes. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, I'm not sure why they did it like that. Uh, one thing that's pretty noteworthy, while well, I normally don't bring up the stats, is uh, they make a pretty little impact a lot of the time. Uh, we do have 20% uh, bonus to Bright Forest and 20, uh, 10% or sorry, 10 to uh, Bright Forest and 10% to Fey. Uh, this is actually kind of relevant for once due to the event key drop table. Uh, so of course, uh, this week is Bright Forest, and there is multiple different reasons as to why you would want to open event keys this week. Uh, if you don't already have some event keys laying around, uh, don't forget you you can every single week buy 10 of them off of Spoils of War. If you go over to uh, Shop Resources and then all the way to the left here, uh, you normally don't see it on my thing because once you buy it, you can't get any more of it for the week. However, you can get up to 10 of these per week for 10 event keys and highly advise doing so. It's a okay amount of glory, like the exchange rate is definitely pretty good. And uh, you definitely want to be doing that every single week, but normally you don't see it here because whenever we go back to that menu, uh, it kind of disappears <laughs> all the way over there. I'm not sure why, but anyways, make sure to do that. As a great week to be opening event keys. So as far as uh, what's available, if we go over to uh, Bright Forest right over uh, here, I'll be able to see, or sorry, I just clicked Blade of the Lands. I meant Bright Forest right next to each other. Whoops. But uh, we can end up seeing everything that is in the drop table here. Uh, one thing to note is things that are not in the event key drop table include the star, which is in the Valky drop table. However, that is not the event key drop table, as well as the four faction troops that are from the Sunken Fleet. Uh, some of them are pretty decent as well, like the Empower one from um, uh, Sunken Fleet as well as uh, Mirage Queen. Uh, which is used for 50% mana start. However, uh, they are not in the drop table. One other one that isn't, though, is still available this week is um, Doom of Nature. Uh, Doom of Nature, we oddly enough do have a green Doom, which uh, I guess synergizes pretty perfectly with this. However, it is not in the drop table. So to conclude, the six things that are not in the drop table are the Star, the Four Faction Troops, and the Doom of Nature. Uh, however, oddly enough, pretty much all of those things are available right now. The Star is in Valky drop table. Uh, the, ta uh, the Doom of Nature is from the current green Tower of Doom that we have going on. And the four faction troops can be obtained at any point just by throwing chaos shards at the portal of Sunken Fleet. Uh, everything else you see here is obtainable. So what is actually relevant? Uh, most noteworthy thing, if you're a newer player, get Leprechaun. Uh, normally uh, one slightly hard thing, oddly enough, from like a standard quick kill uh, Rowan team is oddly enough trying to get Leprechaun. So all this stuff is like super easy to get. Urskia Shield is get 250 wins off of Urskia Hero Class. Uh, from the Sentinel Hero Class, this is 100% consistent and you just get it after you do that grind. For Wayne, you get automatically for free from completing a Forest of Thorns. Mirage Queen, while RNG based, is a much denser or, or a much more concise drop table uh, in the Underworld. So it generally doesn't take that many resources. If you tried for it for a couple days or even a week as you just started out, uh, you'd easily be able to get it. I guess it might be a little bit hard to get it fully traded, but uh, there are RNG orbs 
which uh, make that a little bit easier to get those final two traits, uh, which makes, uh, oddly enough, one of the hardest things to do a lot of the time, getting a Leprechaun. And uh, because it's completely RNG-based, if you would get it in something like the Glory or Gem Key uh, drop table or Seal Keys or similar things. However, during a opportunity like a Bright Forest event week where you can get in event keys, it is absurdly easy to get. You could probably open just a few event keys and probably just have them laying there. So uh, this makes it super easy to get him. Uh, he's one of the best, if not the best, man accumulator in the entire game, uh, having an empower into a, pretty much a full board clear, at least a lot of uh, uh, extra mana there. And you also get some gold on top of it. So overall, amazing troop. And if you uh, do not have it right now, uh, you definitely do not want to leave this week without it. Uh, aside from that, uh, there's a few okay things that are worth uh, picking up. For example, a Queen Titania. Uh, she has a really decent full AoE damage. It's even better this week due to 20% additional stats, where she does damage to all enemies with the potential of gaining an extra turn if there's 13 plus red on the board. Uh, pretty substantial amount of damage combined with her boost ratio since she does it to all enemies. She also is among one of the better fairy fire options in the entire game relative to what her ability is, being able to fairy fire enemies every single time you take an extra turn, uh, which allows her to do even more damage off of her ability that is already pretty decent at uh, doing so. And aside from that, most of the mythics here are pretty underwhelming though. If I'm not mistaken, uh, this might actually be the first time you can event key for Fountain of Stars. I believe this is the case. I'm actually not 100% certain, but I'm pretty sure if you're playing 100% free to play, uh, this might be the first time you can even get this thing, or definitely the first time where you can event key for it, if nothing else. So Fountain of Stars was from Campaign 7? six numbers i have no clue there's so many these days but anyways it was from like a campaign or two ago and um its main gimmick is that it gets to do a bunch of potions overall i feel like i never really use this thing it's not like super horrible but it's under the category of man accumulating mythic and generally man accumulating mythics aren't as good as damage mythics and this is a good example of one of them not being that good uh the other big issue with it is it's bless it just isn't high enough chance to really do much but anyways long story short uh this is among one of the first few times you could get it as free to play so definitely make sure to at least attempt though you are struggling with two other mythics so you could end up getting sooner or the other one instead it's completely rng if you're going to get it or not but uh it is worth mentioning nonetheless so you're mostly looking for a leprechaun and for or the um, Queen of Tanya. Those are like the two main things you want to leave with this week, as well as the new uh, one. So uh, we end up getting a new uh, legend this week, King Aberon. He just came out. Uh, this is a really good troop. If you look at his ability, he probably seems completely useless. Uh, he gives a bunch of life and uh, five magic to all allies, which is okay amount of static magic. But overall, if this was his ability, like, we're, we're not seeing much here. Then it ends up creating a Firestorm and enchants all Fae allies. Like, that's okay. Uh, obviously, the enchant is appreciated because you're probably going to be using him with Fae's, uh, how, if you're going to bother using this mechanic. Uh, however, that's not the reason why you use him. Uh, the reason is this right here. Uh, he gives all Fae allies 50% mana start. This is really, 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 really good. Uh, I might even need to cover a video this week just going over teams with him, though we will be mentioning one when we go over all the teams during this video. However, uh, this is insanely good. Um, the fact that he can enchant all allies while having a 50% mana start to all Fae, while of course being Fae himself, uh, this is a really, really solid option that has a lot of synergy. Uh, even if we're just looking at the kingdom itself, we could see one of the more obvious ones to end up doing this into is Queen Titania. Uh, Queen Titania, more devastating now than uh, ever, already was a pretty decent troop and now is made even better by this. Uh, one other one that is really noteworthy is, uh, it's not from this kingdom though, but Rowain. Uh, Rowain does count as a Fae. While you normally use it under Mirage Queen for Elemental, kind of funny that both of them are from the same location, but uh, while you generally do use... Um, and by same location, I mean two, the both the two 50% mana starts. But even though Rowan is from a different kingdom, um, it is really, really good synergy. Uh, it ends up getting 50% mana start either off of um, Fae or off of uh, Mirage Queen. Uh, so you have two different options from the same kingdom now to end up giving a half mana start. One thing that's pretty nice, though, is Leprechaun, of course, is also a Fae. Uh, and even though he doesn't need this for mana, what you can use it for is team bonus. So actually, I guess I'll show the team real quick just to kind of show this. However... Um, as far as this is concerned, uh, you can actually get a lot of additional stats this way. So this is all the stats that we're getting now that we have this kind of synergy. So, of course, this is kind of like a standard Rowan team just made into a King uh, Aberon team uh, that would just be structured around Rowan. And uh, look at all these extra stats that we're getting. Uh, we're getting six additional attack, which normally in this kind of context of team isn't too relevant. But we're also getting nine additional magic and six additional armor, uh, which, of course, is a pretty substantial amount of buff to Rowan. Uh, as far as its overall damage output, obviously we're also getting 24 HP. However, 24 HP in most situations where you'd be using this team isn't really too relevant uh, as it's not actually providing any damage option. Whereas the magic and armor is pretty useful. 
Um, so it does have that going for it. So you can end up getting this kind of team synergy now, now that we have these typings to align uh, pretty nicely. So uh, pretty interesting things to see what that can end up doing. Uh, it also has synergy with things like Hierophant because it counts as Fae. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Frost Mage is also Fae, so you can end up getting synergy there if you want to. So definitely has a lot of potential going forward. Uh, aside from that, uh, we do have Tower of Doom. I do want to cover a video like comprehensively on Tower of Doom this week. However, I do just want to go over a brief uh, synopsis of it for any of you uh, who uh, haven't played Tower of Doom before. Or, of course, we have it only once every 11 weeks, so not really a game mode that uh, is discussed that much. But basically, uh, there are four room options. It might initially look like it's just a faction, like, oh, there's a bunch of rooms, we just take all the rooms and uh, move forward. You do not want to do every single room in a Tower of Doom. Uh, basically, the main premise of this is uh, there are four of them. Uh, across your guild, all four of these rooms, every single floor is the exact same. What I have is not the same as what your guild will have. However, across your guild, it is the exact same for every single one of the 30 members or however many you have uh, in your guild. So basically, uh, in order to progress the floor, you have to find an unlock scroll. Uh, one of these four rooms will have an unlock scroll that will then unlock the boss room. That will then allow you to take the boss room and then move forward. However, there are plenty of other rooms that you're going to want to be uh, taking along the way. Uh, as far as the main ones that you primarily want to focus, it is power, heroism, luck, haste, and fireball. Uh, so these are all the things that aren't to unlock that you want to uh, end up taking. Uh, the main most noteworthy ones are probably hero uh, heroism and uh, fireball. Uh, they're so relevant that they're even uh, on the side here as far as the little tracker. So uh, basically what these allow you to do is uh, save quite a bit of time. Uh, they even kind of say what they say end up doing here. So this one ends up uh, clearing out any non-boss room. Basically what it means by this is any of these uh, preemptive rooms. You can see there's a little scroll icon and you can simply just instantly do it. Uh, with a fireball, you generally want to save these for the later rooms. Both of these you want to save until you get pretty deep. Uh, the main objective of a Tower of Doom is to reach 25 floor comp uh, completion until this is floor 26. The main reason for this is you end up getting these green or whatever color the week is uh forge scrolls forge scrolls are as you guys know pretty extremely rare uh they are a uh, category uh, right over here uh that um uh, of course, come in one in every single color, and they're used primarily for upgrading the uh, Doom weapons, as they end up mentioning if you end up uh, clicking on any of them. And of course, uh, there's a whole category of uh, weapons that are considered underneath uh, Doom. Uh, oops, that's not an M. <laughs> that's not an M. But there's like a whole category of weapons that are considered Doom. Uh, as far as which ones are worth upgrading, the main ones I would say are the ones that do full AoE damage into Doom Skull Convert are the main ones that you want to go for. Uh, as well as, um, like for example, with this week's um, scrolls, you'd probably want to upgrade Doom Glaive if you have. Uh, because this is the one that goes to green and hits all enemies it's the Doom Skull Convert. The other next best category uh, are the books. Um, these are, you probably see a lot in Guild Wars, especially if you're in like end game Guild War, really high um, bracket. Uh, you'll probably see these a lot. They're really devastating, really strong. Uh, while they're generally not used offensively, they are insanely ridiculously broken for defensive um, Guild Wars. So uh, those are probably the biggest two priorities with the Doom Skull Convert AoE related ones being the absolute highest priority of Doom Weapon to end up upgrading. Uh, we also ended up getting a new category uh, this specific week. Oh, we got Trippy ready. But uh, we end up getting a new category of them uh, this week as well called Daggers. Um, you can end up spending 500 gems during a Tower of Doom to unlock whatever the new Doom Weapon is. I advise always doing this even if the weapon is useless and this weapon is useless uh, but I would still advise at least minimum going to here though ideally going to tier 6 as it gives you the best value for scrolls uh, which I'll probably be doing later but for now just up to tier 4 uh, d buying up to tier 4 costs 500 buying all the way to tier 6 ends up costing you um uh, 1,350 gems. But anyways, as far as this weapon is concerned, it's a new category of troop that, uh, or weapon that just came into the game today. It is the dagger uh, weapon typing for Doom weapons. Uh, basically, what these do is they deal damage to the last enemy, boosted by green ally, or uh, green gem, sorry, at a 1 to 1 ratio. And if they have a Doom, uh, it will then deal a double the amount of damage. And if there's, a, then there's a 3% chance per tempering level to end up killing uh, the enemy. So this weapon is pretty bad in every possible context I could ever think of. So for example, um, the, one of the biggest issues with this is it's the thing that Assassin fixed that for whatever every other like insta-kill weapon doesn't fix. And it's that uh, this weapon both deals damage and insta-kill rolls on the exact same unit. One really nice thing about something like the Assassin Hero class is that you're actually doing uh, a divide of your damage. You're doing skull damage to first slot while being able to proc insta-kill on last slot, which divides your damage over the course of two different troops simultaneously. The problem with this weapon and many other Assassin-like weapons is that the same thing that it's hitting is also the same thing that's rolling the insta-kill chance on. Meaning that if you are going to be rolling the insta-kill, well, you just wasted all the damage 
damage that you would have already been able to do off your weapon instead of having it applied to something else on the enemy team. So it's a very clunky weapon type that just isn't that good. Even at max, it's only going to have a 30% insta-kill chance, which is very low for no extra turn potential, no man accumulation, no nothing on top of it. One other thing that's really weird is let's say you even wanted to use this in the Tower of Doom event itself. The Doom has immune to insta-kill. So yes, it's doing like double damage to it, but that's not even enough to one-shot it. And you can't even insta-kill it when you do get the insta-kill roll because it has immune to insta-kill. It just doesn't make any sense at all. And uh, honestly, it's probably among one of the weakest, maybe not the absolute weakest Doom weapons. There's some pretty bad ones out there, but uh, it is really, really bad. I would still get it for completionist purposes though. Still counts as a weapon for your thing and trying to get these after the fact are so annoying. So if you have the 500 gems, you might as well put it towards the event. However, uh, it's a pretty bad weapon that you're not, definitely do not upgrade it. <laughs> There are so many better ones out there. Anyways, uh, as far as the rest of the Tower of Doom, explaining the rest of this. So, of course, the full room thing. Basically, you want to report back to your guild the uh, better rooms. We have Heroism and Fireballs as the primary two that will allow you to uh, progress through. Uh, you mostly want to save these for the later end. Uh, for example, if you're trying to do only up to floor 25th's completion, you tend to use these on the last few floors, uh, like 22, 23, 24, 25, in order to complete them out, where Fireballs will end up taking out the primary rooms that you need to end up taking, as well as the uh, Heroism being used to skip the entire thing to get the entire floor done. Though do keep in mind, uh, when you use a Heroism, you do have to specifically make sure to uh, have done any of of the important rooms let's say for example that uh, we had a fireball on this room right here uh, we wouldn't simply want to heroism the entire floor we'd want to go take the fireball first and then use the heroism to clear out the entire floor basically unlocking uh, allowing us to and skip the uh, skip the unlock room that we end up needing uh, but aside from that there are a few other things that you kind of want to look for haste is kind of a neutral one it seems like it's not doing anything because all it's doing is giving you back one sigil at a cost of one sigil since every single battle ends up costing one sigil it's basically a one-to-one exchange. However, the reason why you do want to end up taking haste is because of um, uh, it ends up bringing you closer to Valraven. So every single battle, um, you end up having Valraven chance, and it has like a weird pity timer thing, where after like a certain amount of battles, it will guarantee end up giving you a Valraven, and uh, this haste ends up, uh, even though it seems like it's doing nothing, you're using one sigil and then getting one sigil back, it is moving you closer to getting the two sigil drop off of a Valraven, so even though it seems like some of the times it's doing literally nothing, it is indeed giving you like a fraction of a sigil. I would say uh, it's like one-fifth or one-fourth or so of a sigil uh, increase overall. Of course, you get it all as a big burst of simply two at once uh, but it's effectively what it ends up doing is like uh, around that much of a sigil so if you're a little bit pressed on sigils or if you're not buying as deeply into tears you could end up doing it that way and aside from that uh, there is uh, luck and power uh, these two are potentially worth skipping after a certain point as they do have a bit of diminishing returns however luck counts as two doom kills so basically you get a dooms defeated number over here and this is based on how many of these dooms you end up killing however taking a lucky scroll will count of two of these uh, this will progress two different things one is the reward system which is based on how many dooms you've taken um like right here for example if we got a lucky scroll we'd be able to complete out stage seven because that would count as two uh towards uh that uh, the other thing that is uh, used for is the leaderboard the leaderboard is pretty underwhelming for tower of doom which is one of the reasons why i say the luck room is kind of worth skipping after a certain point as leaderboard is pretty pointless for this uh, game mode as uh, the reward that you're getting back is uh, pretty minuscule there's no orbs there's no like any other thing it's just those little green things and gems at an amount that is not even enough to pay back what you end up spending to even get to that point on the leaderboard so overall one of the worst leaderboards in the game so you don't really need to worry about having a super high amount of points you're mostly looking just to complete out stage 12 and getting to floor 25th completion aside from that uh what was the last scroll i didn't end up mentioning here there was one other one. Oh yeah power uh power basically what power does is a bunch of bonuses for this game mode and it basically ticks up each one of these by a uh, one uh not the bigger number by one but the smaller number by one so for example right here uh we need to find two more magic or two more powers in order to end up getting this magic one to go up to a whole additional magic and it'll give us another plus one magic and similarly like right here we need to find five of the hp ones or simply five powers in order to go and get it up uh, generally speaking you only want to be taking powers uh, there is technically a plus one for all four of the stats hp armor attack and magic individually however they're really bad value compared to just taking a power and uh, you, there's even a point where uh, power has such diminishing returns because of how many you end up needing because you need increasingly more every single time like for example once we need to get 15 life uh, for example we'll end up needing to get 16 of them so it keeps going higher and higher as far as how many we end up needing which makes it have quite a bit of diminishing return you're mostly just looking to get like 10 all stats or so uh, because everything beyond there starts to get gets to quite a diminishing return uh, aspect uh, once it starts getting to like those double digit uh, areas. 
but um, those are the main rooms that you end up wanting to be taking. Everything else, uh, probably not uh, worth it uh, for the most part as far as um, rooms are concerned. So those five and unlock. Uh, and you just want to have some kind of system to report it back to your guild. Anyways, we'll be covering a little bit more of an in-depth video on that, uh, hopefully tomorrow. But that's just a quick synopsis on it. Anyways, uh, long story short, uh, with that out of the way, let's go and uh, get the rest of the things. So, uh, things that we have going on this week. Tuesday, we have Sunken Fleet Faction. Really good troops there. Uh, however, you can get those troops at any point. You don't have to wait till tomorrow. Uh, overall, pure factions, not too bad. Uh, with potions, it's pretty easy because you have two full AoE options that you normally run. Or it's the same troop, but twice. He has a uh, mana link that goes into himself. You have Mirage Queen to half mana start your entire team. So overall, pretty easy faction to end up doing with potions. Uh, it can even be done without potions. So you do need a little bit of bulky stats to survive and to have a damage output that doesn't take forever. Uh, Wednesday, we have the uh, Cat Sif, which if I'm not mistaken is a bright uh, forest uh, bonus, which energizes with a couple things this week. Uh, mostly just for um, the fact that we have 20% extra bonus for a lot of things in bright forest uh, this week. So we can get some extra bonus on top of that. Uh, aside from that, Thursday class of is hero fin hero fin's a weird hero class it's a triple damage burning hero class that generally isn't used too often however it has two big benefits now one is a troop literally just came in today that now half mana starts it so it has that going for it uh, but the other thing that's really relevant and is unique to it is it is the only triple damage burning hero class that has cleanse on extra turn uh, this is pretty relevant because if you're doing uh, skull spam and your enemy's spamming like entangle or freeze on you, well, you will never be frozen on skulls and you'll never be entangled on skulls because your hero class in first slot that's constantly getting extra turns off of skulls or anything that they're doing uh, will constantly be cleansing. So you won't be able to uh, be, get frozen on that. So you won't have to worry about uh, losing your turn to skull extra turn or to entangle to making you do zero damage. It kind of bypasses all that. Well, this is a very situational mechanic with elementalists becoming more and more relevant because of how ridiculous good is at applying freeze and all those various things can be pretty decent though then again now that i think about it uh, you do have to still worry about the stun stunning out your trait so <laughs> i guess that wouldn't actually help too too much with elementalists but still helps with like those kind of like flash freezes those things that entangle at start a battle freeze at start a battle other similar mechanics to that that could be uh really annoying for the first couple turns here if it can kind of bypass it so kind of a situational hero class that you don't tend to use too often but uh it's still relevant that it now has a half mana start and aside from that, this Friday we have a pretty underwhelming event. We just have a arena event. Um, arena events pretty bad. Doesn't really give much. Has no unique rewards. Never brings in any new content. And overall, uh, pretty skippable. <laughs> so uh, mostly more time to do Tower of Doom if you uh, want to get that done. Anyways, as far as Soul Forge, I actually forgot to look at it. So let's see what do we have uh, so far this week. So as far as Soul Forge is concerned. Uh, looks like we don't have anything too over the top. Uh, Possessed King is a pretty good man accumulator. Personally, not a huge fan of it, but, uh, it is really good in various skull spam teams. It explodes two random gems when matching for an extra turn. This does stack with the hero class one that does one explosion for three total explosions. So you can end up doing it with, uh, some kind of, like, uh, skull spammer. Maybe like a double skull convert hero as your man accumulator and then this thing. There's a couple combinations that you can end up doing. Uh, but overall, he's primarily used for like double convert skull spam teams or really just like literally any skull spam team as they allow skull spam to basically uh, gain man accumulation, which is a pretty uh, useful mechanic. He also has the t highest total amount of transforms in the game. While they're all RNG based at a 20% chance, he can theoretically, when super lucky, uh, hit three transforms in a single turn. While this is obviously rare based on rolling three twenty. Uh, it is still relevant that he is a lot of the time going to be hitting at least one, uh, which makes him a, one among one of the better transforming troops in the entire game. Uh, it is super luck based to be able to use this mechanic, however when it works properly it is extremely devastating. It can even lead to pretty much an auto win uh, when you end up hitting two or three of them in a more important battle, uh, but you are putting it down to luck on if it would or would not. Uh, end up landing it. But uh, if you're going to craft anything this week, uh, that's probably the way to go. Uh, Umanef is becoming increasingly less relevant given that uh, Zugoth is just better than it. It's basically just a cheaper Zugoth. But uh, Zugoth uh, easier than ever, especially if they're going to keep doing week-long vault weeks and uh, so many vault weeks in general. Uh, but uh, overall, if you're going to craft something it's Possessed King, uh, I wouldn't consider it super high priority. But if you're looking to build some really quirky uh, skull spam teams, it's uh, definitely something to consider uh, as he's one of the best utility options for man accumulation relative to the teams. Aside from that, as far as weapons are concerned, uh, we do have a uh, trickster shot, which um, I don't feel like is too relevant in the current state of the game, but it's basically inverse mang. So the whole thing that mang does is it tears all the armor of an enemy and then gives you a bunch of attack. This basically does the inverse of that in that it
tears all the uh, armor of an enemy and then gives you magic uh, based on it. This is ever so situationally useful. The biggest issue with it is that it's very slow uh, more often than not, uh, especially compared to just using Mang. And uh, Mang is just free. This thing, you know, you have to get during these events. I would still probably pick it up if you have the spare resources for it, as it is a utility tr uh, tr uh, weapon that gets used from time to time. However, overall, it's uh, pretty underwhelming and not really one that gets much usage, but might still be worth uh, considering. Aside from that, uh, Fairy Ring uh, might be a bit more relevant now. Uh, Fairy Ring ends up creating a bunch of green and purple based on Fae. Uh, this is now relevant now that Fae's can get 50% uh, mana start off the new troop that just came out today. So uh, this ring has probably finally become viable. I haven't actually messed around with this ring yet since uh, the 50% mana start. However, I could definitely see some teams being structured around this ring now as you'll be able to go and... Um, build uh, just a complete pure fate team off of this now of course you could have done this before but now with a 50 percent mana start this makes it more devastating than ever uh the only real big issue with it is the colors that it create i wish it was like a green or red or something similar um because a lot of things within this um uh, within the kingdom as well as phase kind of want to be going green red rather than green purple more so i feel uh it's a little bit weird that it doesn't use gr uh, red nor does it create red i find that a little bit weird but uh, overall, it's um, it's an okay weapon. If I'm not mistaken, we should have a Bright Forest version of this, which is also not... Oh! 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 Okay, there's one other relevant thing. But before I uh, go over that, one second. Um, there should also be another version of that. Uh, somewhere is here... This, what is... Where, it, where? Hello? Do we not have one yet? <laughs> I'm looking for the... Um, do I just not see it this morning? Where on earth... I, I'm looking for the one for um, this kingdom. The one that creates double based on... It's not Aegis, is it? Oh, no, it is just Aegis. Okay, I thought this was some kind of shield weapon. Never mind, I'm literally hovering over it. So, uh, yeah, this one creates green and red, which would explain why the other one doesn't. But anyways, um, this one specifically when you're doing a Bright Forest-related team uh, ends up creating a bunch of green and red based on Bright Forest, which I wish it was the other way around on the Fey one, but oh well. Um... But uh, obviously this doesn't have as much of a range because you're going to use it with Bright Far specifically instead of the entire range of uh, Fey. However, it is still a pretty good weapon and maybe worth uh, considering now that you can 50% mana start almost everything within the kingdom due to the fact that the good majority of the kingdom is Fey related. So uh, this weapon also more relevant than ever. Um, so both of those now worth considering more than ever due to the 50% mana start that Fey's now have. Even though this one specifically isn't for Fey, uh, a lot of things within Bright Forest are Fey as well as the thing that gives half mana start. But anyways... Celestial Flask, if I am not mistaken, I almost didn't catch this earlier, but uh, this is the very first time, asterisk, I can't remember if this is, I'm pretty sure it is though, but this is the very first time free-to-play players can get Celestial Flask. So this weapon uh, is insanely, 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 insanely good. I haven't been using it too much lately. But um, it's arguably one of the best 10 weapons in the entire game. Um, so this is the potion mechanic weapon. Of course, potions we had, gosh, how many seasons ago? Three, two, some amount, some number of seasons ago. Uh, we end up having uh, potions as the main uh, premise. And this is by far the best thing in the entire game for creating potions. It creates three potions, all of the same color. It doesn't state that here, but it does do it of the same color. Uh, of either blue, green, red, yellow, or purple. Uh, it'll do it of one of those colors, but when it does, all three of the potions will be of that color. And then it'll end up gaining an uh, extra turn. So what you can end up doing with this is um, throwing down potion, gaining your auto extra turn, and then having something like a Leprechaun, a Thrall, a Merilith, or, you know, any kind of mass-destroying, um, exploding kind of troop. Um, just destroy them all. And then you get a bunch of mana accumulation back. You get all the potions popping. Uh, all the potions, uh, I forget the exact range, actually, off the top of my head. But I believe when a potion is destroyed, it creates, like, um, four to seven gems? I actually completely forget. But it creates, like, several gems uh, of its color, corresponding color. And uh, with the uh, three of them, you're going to be getting like upwards of 10 gem spawn onto the board. So not only are you going to be like full clear on the board uh, after you just got an extra turn, but you'll also be able to go and get all your mana accumulating back. Uh, and any uh, color that ends up creating will just give you a bunch of mana of. One thing that's noteworthy though is that it doesn't actually create brown for whatever reason, not sure why. But it does every single color that uh, is not brown. But uh, basically you end up uh, casting this, destroying the board, 
Getting all your mana back, they pop and end up getting you another extra turn because they you're creating so many gems onto the board. You then definitely max all the mana of anything that uses that color, and then boom, you just go and rinse and repeat. Uh, it's a really, really strong mana accumulating weapon, among one of the stronger in the game. You do need some teams that kind of structure around it, and uh, it, it's a bit hit or miss sometimes on if it's like worth using on a given team, because sometimes it's better just to have better damage or different mana accumulating weapon, as there's a whole arsenal of them these days. However, I, I would still consider it among one of the best weapons in the entire game, and I would not advise leaving this week without it. If you were to get any one weapon from Soul Forge or anyone anything from Soul Forge, I'd probably say Celestial Flask is the way to go. Uh, this is also, as I mentioned, the first time free-to-play players can really access this weapon. So if you're free to play, well, now's your chance. <laughs> uh, because of course, a lot of paid players, if you were playing several months back, uh, you probably already have this weapon laying around. However, uh, free-to-play players, this is your first time to really go get it. So um, yeah, make sure to do so, as it is an outstanding weapon, and you should not leave this week without it. And that pretty much goes for everyone. Um, and aside from that, Summer Aegis and Fairy Ring, depending on if you want to mess around with... Uh, honestly, almost every weapon that's available this week is worth getting, which is kind of unfortunate. But if I was to put it in priority order, Celestial Flask, hands down, is number one priority. Second highest priority is getting one of either Summer Aegis or Fairy Ring, um, maybe even both of them. And then I guess I would kind of put Trickster Shot in the lowest priority. I don't know. Trickster Shot, it's a good weapon in concept. I just feel like it's not as good these days because there's just other better insta-kill options that we keep getting. Uh, however, um, it's still a weapon that you eventually want in your arsenal. So if you can somehow afford all four, given that we just had a Vault Week and you stocked up on a bunch of resources, hopefully you can. Um, but um, definitely Celestial Flask highs priority with the Man Accumulator ones being next. And then the Trickster Shot, well, uh, very low priority of the bunch, still worth... Uh, considering getting. Anyways, now that we're almost like 30 minutes in, actually, I think we're actually already over 30 minutes in, just barely. Uh, let's go over some teams. So, of course, uh, as per usual, the teams will be in the description below uh, for everything going on this week. Uh, first off, we have ourselves the... Um uh, the Tower of Doom Godmother team. I kind of already showed this one a bunch, however, this is the first time where it's actually applicable for something. Of course, Tower of Doom's uh, restriction is of green this week, particularly. So we're going to be going in with a, um, a Godmother team that I've kind of been showing. Um, this might struggle a little bit at the super high end, but I feel like for most of the time it should be fine. One other thing to consider about Tower of Doom, which is why this is not a liability, is even though it looks like the mode is structured like the Underworld, you do get your entire team revived every single time. So if we happen to to lose Merilith to a death, it doesn't actually matter because it revives every single time we go from battle to battle. Uh, deaths have absolutely no consequence as long as you don't lose the battle. It's uh, as if nothing even happened, so you could lose three of your troops and still win, and it's still perfectly fine. Obviously, ideally, you don't want to do that, as that would slow down your pacing quite a bit if you had that many deaths. However, if you like are using a team that's sacrificing like one troop or something similar, uh, you don't really have to worry about it as much compared to something like factions, which allows you to do some slightly different things than what you would do in a faction context, since a death does not actually matter. So but this team will be messing around with that. Uh, next, we have a bit more of a like, kind of standard one that I would kind of use for an event like this. Uh, you can end up replacing out the catchers for another man accumulator and another damage if you so choose, if you happen to not have double catchers. But the main premise here is you use either Yasmin's Pride or Askea Shield if you don't have Askea Pride. I mean Yasmin's Pride, in which you would go and boost up all your stats. You then get a boosted um, ratio off of Ketris. And then you basically just use Ketris to kill it out. And of course, we're just using Leprechaun here to uh, man accumulate. And for the cheaper team, do keep in mind for a Tower of Doom event, you actually do not have to use a weapon corresponding to the color. So you are allowed to use something like a brown weapon, for example, where we're going to be using our Skia Shield here to feed Rowan. And this is per, uh, just a uh, variant of the... Um of the uh, new King uh, Abron team, where you can end up getting a uh, King Abron uh, to 50% mana start your Rowane instead of using a Mirage Queen. This gives you slightly more stats, as I showed earlier, and you just use your Skier Shield to end up boosting it up. And we're using Elementals here because it's a little bit tankier than the other alternative. Uh, next up, we have the faction teams for Sunken Fleet. So it is a red-blue restriction, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so here we kind of have a standard uh, Tesla team, just with a Merilith Fair as a Man Accumulator, uh, with Urskia Shield to end up boosting up. Uh, for the uh, mid-range battles, uh, we have basically a kind of standard Iron Gut uh, Zugoff team, using, a, once again, Merilith as the Man Accumulator. Uh, for Weapon, I just chose Essence of Evil. Obviously, Weapon is pretty flexible as far as we can use, but uh, figured in this kind of context, we can go with a nice Essence of Evil, does a nice amount of Disable, gives you a bunch of Man Accumulation, even though Merilith will primarily Primarily be your main man accumulator on the team. And we're using Titan just to have a little bit of tank ability, though you could go the more offensive route if you want. That's a bit more of the safer route. Anyways, uh, next up we have Pure Faction. So Sunken Fleet, uh, the main uh, three that you generally want to use are the Mirage Queen, Drowned Sailor, and Water Elemental. 
Theoretically, Warder Elemental on his own can kind of kill, so you can even go like Mirage Queen Triple Warder Elemental. Uh, Drowned Sailor is used for a similar reason why Empower is used in a couple other factions, in the fact that if the enemy has Empower, well, that means, um, or if you have Empower, that means the enemy also has Empower. So you want this almost more so just to deny the enemy's version of it. So even if you don't really feel like you're going to be needing it, though generally you will because you're feeding blue into important things, but... Um, is, is basically almost more so to counter out the enemy because the enemy on both the first and final battle will have a drowned sailor so you'll want to use your empower to either counter out theirs or if you see the board is bad just don't cast yours uh, however many more often than not you're going to cast yours immediately in order to make sure the enemy does not get value from their uh, drowned uh, sailor so uh, you can end up doing it that way and uh, you kind of just need it to counter theirs and obviously the drowned sailor blue mana goes into your water elemental water elemental does it damage all enemies while spamming it out into some water link and your main premise is just keep spamming water elemental elemental until you win uh, it is possible to win it off a mirage queen skull spam however it is generally more consistent just to keep order elemental chipping them down until you win and that's the main premise of the pure faction especially when you're running with potions uh, because you're going to have a lot more stats to be able to even use um, a full aoe damage and um, order elemental will definitely be way superior when doing it through a uh, potioned pure faction which if you're running on a tuesday event is most likely the way that you're going to be running it down anyways Next up, we have the Hierophant class event. Uh, here, we actually get to use Queen Titania, so like a War and Peace Queen of Titania kind of thing. Just a double standard AoE that you would kind of run on a Thursday event. However, we get to use the new King Abralon with it. And of course, uh, as the new synergy or the standard synergy with it now, uh, obviously, you're almost always going to be using a Leprechaun. Might seem a little bit weird using something that has Empower with something that has a 50% mana start. However, this is still really relevant in order to get a little bit extra stats as well as just the overall uh, amount of uh, damage that you'll be able to do while feeding, mana accumulating that much into your uh, allies with that instant uh, first turn explosion and basically you're just spamming Queen Titania uh, War and Peace until you end up getting the win. Pretty standard class events just with some decent options and as I kind of already mentioned and probably will be covering a bit more of a video specifically on him as he's a pretty relevant option now um, between Queen Titania, Rowan, uh, I believe there's a few mythics out there that could even actually benefit quite a bit from this but uh, overall King Aberon also I absolutely love that his abbreviation is KO. Uh, it's also a little bit ironic since he's completely a support unit and doesn't actually do damage in any way i guess he kind of helps you do damage in many ways but it itself does not actually do anything but support the rest of your team but uh, of course uh, this 50 percent mana start fey has a lot of potential and i personally feel like one of the best uses for it is just the brand new rowan team if you thought rowan couldn't get any better well king abralon has come in <laughs> it's not much better than how a standard rowan team would be However, it is a small improvement due to the stat distribution that you end up getting is better than what we previously were able to do. Uh, I believe I did the math earlier. I think it's like 9 damage or so better than the other team that you can kind of do before. Uh, overall, it's not too huge a difference, but any amount of extra damage on a Rowan team uh, to make its range even better uh, is nice. Because Venetia, of course, uh, is the main one that you tend to use once you get outside of Rowan range. However, if Rowan has a bigger range, then that's a longer area that you wouldn't necessarily need to use Venetia for. And who knows? Maybe even Rowan will be able to take like Explore 5 and stuff pretty consistently and other things into the future uh, as it keeps getting more and more stats and becomes slightly more viable over time. Uh, like with uh, King Aberon now being available uh, for this kind of team synergy, uh, you never know. Uh, of course, it just opens up the range of what Rowan can do the higher her damage is. So, um, yeah, it's not much of an improvement to a Rowan build and you can still replace out Hero. Obviously, this will lower your stats if you go with a different uh, Hero class. But you can use any weapon that doesn't block Rowan as well as any Hero class here. However, it is slightly weaker when not using Hierophant, though uh, it's perfectly fine to not use Hierophant. You can still use this just like you would a Mirage Queen team, where you run literally any weapon that doesn't block Rowan with any hero class at all, and you'll be good to go. Uh, it's basically just a new Mirage Queen team. You can still run the old one. You're not going to really get punished much for doing so if you preferred or don't want to bother getting this thing, though I do advise getting this thing from the event key drop table. But uh, yeah, it's basically the new Rowan team now, uh, or you know, basically the structure of Rowan, Leprechaun, King Aberlon with whatever you do with hero in first slot. Uh, kind of being the new standard Rowan now. So uh, we're definitely opening up the event key drop table to go get all that. Um, highly, highly, highly advise and not leaving this week without three specific things. You want to get Leprechaun uh, from the event key drop table if you happen to not have it, especially if you're a newer player, uh, because that'd be the category of people who wouldn't have it. Um, you want to make sure to get the new Mythic and Queen Titania. Tech or sorry, the new Legend. I mean, why did I say Mythic? It feels like a Mythic though, doesn't it? Uh, but the new Legends as well as Queen Titania, 
Uh, so open event keys to kind of get those two good options. Uh, Queen of Tanya for the damage uh, and the new uh, mythic. Or I keep saying mythic. The new legend for 50% mana start to Fey, which is really solid. And aside from that, you definitely want to get Celestial Flask. Uh, this should be the first opportunity free to play has ever had to get it. So if you didn't end up getting it or if you weren't around or you didn't buy the pass uh, back then, uh, definitely worth um, getting it then uh, as it's a pretty good uh, weapon for uh, mana accumulation and pretty much the only viable way to really do potions. There's a few other ones, but uh, it's the main uh, gimmick that you, or the main weapon or the main option that you have within the game that would end up being able to use and access the potion mechanic, since of course they don't fall from the sky anymore. But anyways guys, I'll wrap it up for now. Uh, we'll be covering Tower of Doom uh, quite in depth uh, two more times this week. Uh, one will be tonight. I'm going to be running through almost the entirety of uh, Tower of Doom on stream. We, of course, we stream every single night Gems of War at 8pm Eastern Standard Time and we'll basically be going over uh, pretty in depth, uh, just, you know, messing around with or not in depth, but you know, we'll be going through almost the entirety of Tower of Doom, so if you want to see like live Tower of Doom gameplay or just watch it after the fact, we'll be doing that tonight. Uh, aside from that, I should hopefully get a guide video out on Tower of Doom. Of course, we went over it a bit during this video, a little bit more than I meant to go over it, but kind of figured I mentioned it. I was kind of tangenting it a bit, but uh, we'll have a bit more of a um, like specific video going over Tower of Doom, as I haven't covered a Tower of Doom guide specifically in quite some time, and I figured now would be a good time, especially since we know the new category of weapon now, uh, so we know basically what the next Tower of Doom will be pretty much for the next year, as far as what weapons we're getting that useless dagger and i was just kind of hoping we'd get a good one there to kind of go over but now it's just another useless tier one unfortunately as are a lot of tower doom weapons and uh, we'll go from there but yeah anyways guys all the teams i mentioned in this video all in description uh this video is already going a little bit long so you should probably say goodbye to all of you hope you have a wonderful week catch you guys later and thank you so much for watching as always greatly appreciated feel free to leave a like on the video it helps out a lot and i'll see you guys soon goodbye everyone and thanks for watching